Okay, that's better. Cool. This webinar is also being recorded, just letting you guys know. Um, it just gives some people time to come in, which is great. All right. Hi, everyone who's joining us. Exciting, exciting. This is like that awkward moment because people are waiting for people to come in and we're all just like smiling, looking really amazing, you know, all together. But this is a great screen to look at. So if you're joining us, welcome. Welcome. Um, I'm going to give people a few more minutes and then I'm going to kick off with our introduction. Uh, but yes, if you're joining us, we're all happy to have you. We're steadily climbing. This is beautiful. We had 180 people registered. So let's hope we get somewhere close to that number. Be great. Oh, Larissa, I'm going to go ahead and hide you. This is Larissa, who's part of our Google Good Fun team, by the way. Um, and then let's. Perfect. Cool. All right. This is when someone should have told me to make a playlist to start music. What were you guys doing? Why, why were you not prepping me? correctly I would have started a really eclectic playlist you know really energetic to get us started no no one has any suggestions on songs that they're feeling Jude any Nigerian songs you want to give us you know any recommended no. Bonaboy obviously Bonaboy Anytime. just wow well, so <laughs> typical just Bonaboy <laughs> any Bonaboy works for me uh, any no. any Bonaboy yeah Noted. All right. Okay. Well, I'm actually going to get us started because we have quite a number of questions and we have a rich conversation going. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. I am Sandra Wadaka, Program Manager at the Global Good Fund. The Global Good Fund is a nonprofit enterprise for entrepreneurs, organizations, philanthropists, people who are interested in creating change and believe that the best way to do that is by investing in an individual. Um, Today with us, we have um, some alumni and some fellows. So we have our current fellow, Gide, and we have our alumni here with us. Um, these are phenomenal leaders who've been through our fellowship program and who are kind of here to have a conversation around education. This is our third part conversation on our Spark Change Ignite Impact Series, which is going to be focused on the education sector. And I'm going to kick it off and have Margot Baines kind of do our introduction, and I'm going to step out. If anyone has any questions, though, feel free to ask me to do the Google Good Fun. But I will be here in the background. So, Margo, the stage is all yours. Okay. Hello, hello. Um, so I'm going to apologize in advance because I am in an airport. Um, I am literally fresh off the plane uh, from Houston, Texas, and I am in San Francisco today. So if you hear someone in this overhead um, audio, that, that is what that is. Um, so I am Margo Baines, and I am the founder and CEO of a company called Youth Enrichment. And um, that is pretty much a self-esteem focused digital learning platform for children. And we help to lower the rates of youth violence. We also help to improve mental health outcomes and increase academic achievement amongst students. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. I will be your lovely moderator um, for this hour. And I wanted to invite our other speakers to just give a little bit of information about themselves um, and a little bit about what they do. And Jide, you can kick us off. Hey guys, uh, very nice to be here. My name is Jide, uh, Jide Ayegbusi. So I lead the team at edduschool.com. Uh, uh, we're basically an education marketplace for, for top schools, uh, parents and lenders. So we built a platform that matches African kids uh, with the right K-12 to uh, independent schools and then you know, finance their education affordably. Currently working with over 8,000 schools in Nigeria and a few hundreds in Ghana, and we're matching hundreds of you know, kids to suitable private schools uh, on a weekly basis. Nice to be here. I will go next because Kareem is a superstar, so he can do the last introduction. <laughs> I want to go after him. Um, I'm Makita Ricketts, and I'm the founder and CEO of Pink Think. We create educational STEM products for girls, specifically focusing on coding. Uh, we focus on teaching them different skills as well as confidence and then also engagement in uh, coding related products. So it's both a software platform and then hardware products they can also use to engage them in STEM. Makeda, that was a kind of you. I was expecting you to say that I was the oldest uh, person on the panel. <laughs> so. 
Um, hey all, uh, Kareem Abulnaga, the founder and CEO of Practice Benefit Corp. Uh, we are 13 years old, so I've been doing this for a really long time now in this space, and I've been studying the inequity in education for a, a lot longer. Um, but uh, we're a mission-driven business that really believes in the power of public schools to educate the next generation of urban leaders, and we do this by uh, leveraging our education champions who look like our students who are from the communities that we're in to run mentoring, tutoring programs, after school, Saturday, summer programs. Um, and we equip them with culturally responsive test prep curricula um, and then have software to help schools communicate with parents and share data in real time. And uh, we work with just over 200 schools in New York City, a couple of schools in Denver and serve just over 18,000 students last year. Awesome. I love how all of us are doing such impressive work and, and making such a huge impact around the world. Um, so I will I want to toss this question over to Jude. So how does your organization work to address equity and access in the education sector? Thanks a lot. So um, as you rightly mentioned, right? So access to quality education is one of the biggest um, challenges that we have in South Saharan Africa. Right. So it's not that we do not have, you know, quality good schools, right? But some of the schools, even many of them are not affordable uh, to, to millions of parents. Uh, as you know, African parents are very aspirational. So they want quality education for their kids, but they can't just afford it. Uh, quality education is not cheap anywhere in the world, not just in Africa, right? So how do we support, you know, these parents who give their kids quality education, regardless of the economic status? That's what we do. So in addition to matching their kids with the right schools, so we finance uh, the education in a way that is affordable. Uh, so that's how we're bridging, you know, that gap of equity, uh, equity access, you know, to quality education across Africa. Thank you for that. Um, and I love how you're addressing um, that equity piece with your uh, with your company. Um, so, what about you, Makita? How how are you addressing equity um, and access to education with your solution? Sure. Well, I think first we focus on a subset of the population. So we definitely focus on girls and closing the, the tech gap and the, hopefully eventually from the gender gap with technology to the wage gap as they get older. So we definitely focus on making sure that we can bring underserved um, young people who are already kind of not being represented fairly uh, kind of up and giving them access to technology that other people kind of take for granted. Um, or creating curriculum specifically for them. So our product definitely focuses on overall, just making sure we have equity um, within that gender uh, bias and technology. Then we also partner with a lot of, basically we partner, we're B2B, so we partner with a lot of corporations and schools, um, especially in underserved communities to make sure that we're also serving those communities first and foremost. Uh, so we partner with foundations, Microsoft Foundation, different foundations that from corporations to make sure that we are addressing underserved communities in particular. Um, that's such an important piece to really address these underserved communities, honestly, because they do not have access to the many of tools that our will to do schools or will to do students may have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so kudos to you for sure, for making sure that our underserved uh, students have access. Um, and then I'll lastly kick that question over to you, Kareem. Um, what are you doing to ensure equity um, and access to your education tools? I mean, we go to the heart of it by partnering with school leaders and making sure that there is access to talent in some of the highest need areas. So a lot of what we've been able to do now over the decade is build a really strong brand that excites folks who may not have thought about an opportunity in education who are from the communities. Um, one, not just empowering them, but allowing them to see the impact that they can make in a child's life, getting them to value that educational experience. And we do that hand in hand with school leaders and we do it on their limited or constrained budgets, but we show them the possibility and um, that has led to additional outcomes for kids that otherwise wouldn't have had them. Yeah, um, I love the outcomes piece. And honestly, and it's it's interesting because when I started my company, it was um, we helped to develop self-esteem in kids. 
And what we used to do was take our facilitators and place them inside of the classroom in order to provide that equity piece. Um, because we knew that this personal development tool, it was necessary around the world with all children. Um, and then putting technology behind it through our platform in Richley, it just enhanced that equity piece. Um, and just for our, something for our listeners to think about um, if you have these tools that you're building, another way that you can make something um, equitable is personalizing that tool, uh, you know, for that student. And, you know, personalization is really just leveraging this technology that we have, uh, finding out how we can incorporate things like machine learning um, or, you know, even this tool of chat GPT that um, I find super useful to incorporate in my learning tool. Um, so this leads me to my next question, which is what are some of the pressing challenges um, that you all are currently facing in this education sector? Um, and then how does your organization work to address those? And Makita, we can start with you since uh, we started with Janae before. <laughs> Sure. Um, I think part of the, I think it's twofold. One thing that's great is that technology is changing really, really fast. So on one hand, it's hard to keep up with it. But on the other hand, there's still access to things that we, we may want to do um, in terms of connecting to students in places where they may not have the right equipment set up. They may not have the right devices. They may not have what they need to actually use, fully utilize our products, uh, especially if you have a hardware or software product. So on one hand, technology is moving really, really fast. But on the other hand, it's hard to make sure that that technology is inclusive, that we can actually utilize it, and that it's working in a way that is helpful to our students and the kids that need it. So I would say that's a challenge that I have in terms of just making sure that what is being built, I am keeping my eye on and keeping up to date on, but that also that it makes sense for what we're trying to do. And in terms of making sure that kids can actually access it and use it when they only have a Chromebook or they don't have certain things at home. So just making sure that we are keeping up with that part of it, I think is a challenge for me always. Um, and then how do I share that technology with them and, and how do we bring them along um, when things are going so fast and a lot of it is only accessible to a few. Yeah, that's obviously a huge issue. I know some of the schools that we go into, um, the schools don't have internet. Uh, so, you know, they can't access these this, this amazing uh, tool that we built and we're going in, but then they don't have internet. Uh, and, you know, partnerships with people like T-Mobile, uh, where they're providing hotspots to the school that helps to address that issue um, of accessibility. So, Jaday, um, I'll shoot that pick, that question over to you and ask you, like, what are some of your most pressing challenges right now? Yeah, so, um, I mean, in Africa, right, so infrastructure challenges will always be there, right? So I'm surprised that you also have that uh, in the U.S. in terms of, like, no access to the internet, right? So um number of you know households are not able to access you know quality internet, right? So sometimes when it, when it's even available, they're not just able to um, afford it or the internet is not stable. And very many are not enabled with like the right you know mobile phones that can enable them access you know content that can help their children get better in terms of education. Uh Having said that, I would say that, you know, like generally in the education space uh, in Africa, the challenges are divided into two, right? So you've got uh, the challenge of assets, right? To the right kind of education. And you also have the, uh, the, the challenge of content, right? Um, the quality of content that they access to. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, access at the moment, about 18 million Nigerians are, are currently out of school, right? Um, yes, and that's like the largest in the world. Uh, so Australia and Africa accounts for the largest, you know, out of school children you know, across the globe, and Nigeria is like the biggest, right? Um, and there's a lot of factors that are responsible for this. I mean, religion uh, is one of those factors. Poverty is another factor. You know, uh, you have, you know, parents, you know, giving their kids, uh, sending their kids to, to the street to trade, as against going to schools, right? Uh, having said that, when it comes to the quality of content that we consume, it's out of date. So we're still using curriculum that my forefather, like you know, my great grandparents used uh, in the in the like back in the days, 
So the curriculum that was used to prepare, you know, uh, the children for the first industrial revolution, right, back in the days, are still very much available <laughs> to, uh, uh, to educate um, uh, kids in this fourth industrial, fourth industrial revolution. It's not going to work. So how do we use technology to be able to, you know, address these challenges, right? It's a big issue uh, in Africa at the moment. And it cuts across all, you know, uh, uh, you know, startups um, uh, that are trying to solve, you know, this these problems. Whether you are solving it from, you know, providing content um, uh, for uh, for schools or parents, or you're providing LMS solution for schools or parents, or my side who providing, you know, like marketplace, market case with schools and providing tuition financing. Like you know, the problem is just very the same uh, and peculiar to us. Margo, yeah. I was going to say, I'm sure you and Mikado will agree, especially here in the United States, but there's four that sort of come to mind for me. One of them is on the tech side, and I don't care what industry you're in, it is relevant. There is huge amounts of disruption that are being caused by AI, and you cannot ignore that. Things that used to take 30 minutes to get done are now being done in 30 seconds. And if you're not using it, you're going to be left behind. But I think uh, also in hand with that are the increases in like cybersecurity issues that we're seeing that are now plaguing schools. There were things that were hitting tech companies before, and we kind of got a little bit of a preview into it when uh, parent data started leaking. But now we're seeing districts being held hostage uh, by folks who are trying to get ransom. And so on our side, our software system that we've been building is airtight from a security standpoint. Um, we've done the SOC 2 compliance, and I think it's something that needs to become an industry norm in the education space. And then on the AI side, our team is continuing to use the tools and making sure that we're proficient in them, right? Because we can't support our schools if we're not using them ourselves. Um, the conversation around equity versus excellence is definitely getting a lot of heat. Um, it's hard to do both, right? Equity kind of says that we need to put our resources to making sure that kids who didn't historically have them um, are now receiving them but it can come at the cost of kids who are needing more, right? Who might be in a gifted and talented program and need to continue to be accelerated and pushed. And when you have finite resources, you need to make a decision. Are we going to push for more equity or are we going to continue to push the top 10 or 15% of students to accelerate? And we're coming in and saying it doesn't have to be an either or, and there may be opportunities where you can alternate or even integrate. Um, both of them. And so when we're using our education champions, we're trying to model best practices, using the teachers in the classroom to maybe focus on the students who might be struggling the most and using the education champions to then work with the higher achievers. So you're still getting a lot of bang for your buck. Um, and on the school side, the teacher with the most experience is working with the students who have the biggest need. Um, politics, I think, is the other big one today. And I think COVID was good in that it showed parents what it was like to be in the classroom and they got firsthand experience with that interaction. Um, but it was bad in that everyone thought after that, that they could do a better job than the teacher, right? It's like looking at someone else's child and saying, I could be a better parent. And I think there are a lot of parents who are sitting there and saying, I could do a better job than the teacher. And uh, the politicians are weaponizing things like culturally responsive curricula, uh, gender identity and what that looks like in schools, what books should be or should not be read and I'm in the camp that we should always expose children and hopefully we've taught them enough to be able to think critically and allow them to consume information because whether they're getting in the classroom um, or somewhere else, just know that they're going to consume that information somewhere else, right? Um, the internet has already proliferized everything. And we have politicians who are weaponizing things like culturally responsive curricula, which is not uh, black studies, right? Culture is what's trending. It's what's happening today. And we use that term to engage children with what's actually happening in society so they can apply what they're learning. And those little things are making it more difficult to be a teacher than it has been before. And then I'd say the last one is the, the after effects of COVID. I think we underestimated just how much investment we would need to catch up uh, from COVID. And I think now we're starting to see that what we had spent wasn't enough. And what we need to continue to help uh, children recover at full scale or even get back to where they were before is more 
than what we had initially assumed. And the reality is we're running out of time because the COVID dollars are expiring and the funding is coming to a lapse. And so we're having to do a lot more with a lot less. And I, I think that's where partnerships are really important, right? Where we don't have time to waste energy. We don't have time to waste resources. And we hope that as schools are partnering with us, they're investing in evidence-based and research-based practices and not guessing as they're kind of going through the day-to-day -day of helping students catch up. Yeah, those are all such great points. I have like so many gems to share, um, but I know we're only here for like another 40 minutes, uh, but I am like with the part about the the politics, right? I know in Florida, they're like banning social and emotional learning in like the schools, which is like, well, why, right? Like this is what is helping our students. And this is actually allowing them to have this accessibility, this equity within the classroom. Um, so for me and for my company, that is a challenge right now because we have a huge client in yeah, Florida okay. and they're pushing back on like social and emotional types of um, curricula. So um, those are all really great points. And it kind of segues into my next question of so what role do you all think that community based alternative education programs play in increasing participation? Um, by directly involving like local stakeholders and addressing unique community needs. Um, and Makita, I, I wanted to direct that question to you. Um, and really just, I would love to hear your thoughts on that question. Sure. Um, I personally actually believe in doing a lot of uh, grassroots community organization work. Um, I think it's a little hard to scale, but I think it's critical to understand the needs of that unique community. What you talked about earlier, Marco, just personalization is huge for kids and technology. Representation is huge for kids and technology and education, especially. Um, and then also understanding the community needs and no one can do that better than the local organization or schools. For us, um, I think we've worked in a couple of different communities with a couple of different stakeholders. And so we've integrated with after school programs, we've integrated with the Girl Scouts, we've integrated with local chapters of uh, other kind of organizations, the YMCA, YWCA, those kind of things that particularly work on those in those communities. And I would say the benefits are enormous. You have the population there that needs to be served. They already know who needs to your products and they already have a targeted group of people that they are trying to work with and have those kids ready for you. It's easy access. The kids are, have already been kind of structured around a program. So it's very easy to integrate with that when they already have that structure of showing up somewhere or they expect certain things that they have done from when they are already working with the organization. So it's very easy to integrate there. They also usually have a relationship with these kids. We've worked in after school programs where they already established relationship with those kids, there's trust there. So you come in and it's a much easier relationship and much easier to get the kids to relax, adopt what you're doing, and then also feel confident, a big part of education for kids, especially underserved kids, women, young girls is confidence. So we really want them to be comfortable. We really want them to be feel that personalization and we really want them to be confident. And that kind of serves best, that kind of works best when they're being served by their own stakeholders in their own community. So I encourage everybody in some point in the journey to kind of engage with a local community organization. And we started doing that with even, even beta testing. So even if you don't, you can't do that directly with your larger audience, you sell directly to consumers. You can still beta test and say, hey, is there a group of kids that I'm trying to reach or in a local community that you guys want me to sit down and talk to? And we can just do some low fidelity prototyping, go to a lab school, go to an or after school program, reach out, find some way to or an enrichment program to reach those kids directly. It's just beneficial to you developing your product and you'll get more out of what your product can do um, even in the long run. And any way you add that to the the process and I personally I do that still I think that's just very important to always kind of go back to the community and make sure we're serving the community but I know that's not for everybody and people can't do that in different parts of their journey but definitely somewhere along the line make sure you're working with a community organization to really understand your your customers and really make sure you're meeting their educational needs those are such great points I think the, the part about scaling that type of um impact it is a bit difficult and it's challenging. Um, and I'm going to get to some of our Q&A or, or questions that we have in the chat in a second. Um, honestly, with 
something that we did was like we would go into these underserved schools and we would implement like these six week uh, self-esteem development programs with these students. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to give them an experience and we didn't just want to create technology and say, here you go, have at it. But that scaling piece of, okay, now how do we replicate this? Um, a thousand times or 2000 times to go into all of the schools that are in the U.S. that have these underserved and underrepresented children. Um, and that's for, for us, that's been a challenge because we know how impactful it is to go about it that way, um, as opposed to just saying, log into Enrichly, have fun. Um, we wanted to give them that human interaction, but uh, it's difficult to scale that. And I think the involvement of these community-based organizations could really change the game in helping to scale the programs and the type of impact that we want to have. Um, so I want to go to one of the questions in the chat. Uh, I would say it's from Charles. So he says, I'm eager to learn from the panelists about how education-focused entrepreneurs can make a lasting global impact. Um, so... Kareem, I will allow you to answer that question. Um, so how are you going to make a lasting global impact through your solution? I think this one's uh, deeper than just how do you do it with your work? But uh, if you're an educator or you've taught before, you know this, that your legacy is the impact that you've had in the classroom with the students that you've taught. And I think one of the things we get caught up with with entrepreneurship is this idea of scale. And if you have been teaching for a while, you sometimes know that the most uh, or the biggest changes can come from one individual. And so it's not how do I serve every single student out there in the world, but how do I have the biggest impact on the students that I am serving? And I think if we can change our perspective to what is the scope that we have in front of us this year um, with the recognition that real change takes time in education. And so one of the other things I always coach folks on who are entering the space is, remember, it takes almost 16 years to go from kindergarten through 12th grade. And then if you're talking about college, it's nearly 20 years, right, of an investment there. And so the things that you're implementing, the impact that you're having today, you may not be able to bear the fruits of until later. And the, the biggest change we can have is in focusing on our scholars and the teachers in the classroom. So I, I always think back to how is what we're doing enhancing the classroom environment at the end of the day, because we want the best possible outcomes for the scholars that we're serving. And I focus more on the kids that we are serving than the ones that we have the potential to serve. And so I think if you're thinking about long lasting change, how do you have the biggest impact on the stakeholders who are already in front of you is what I would be thinking about. Great question. Yeah. Great, great response. Um, and I want to say, so I'm going to come back to that, to something that you said, because it was very interesting. Um, but there was an anonymous uh, question in the chat for Jade, and it's about the challenges that you highlighted. Um, so what are you doing to overcome some of those challenges? So thanks a lot. So I just wanted, like, you know, before I touch on what, I, what I'm doing to, you know, uh, to overcome some of those challenges, touch uh, on what Karim, you know, talked about, right? So, um, you know, it's very, it, it's, you know, it can be very tricky to measure impacts um, in the education space, uh, to be honest. Uh, but also, uh, there are variables that you want to track as an entrepreneur in the education space if, you, if you're very passionate about what you're doing. Uh, for Karim, it's very straightforward, right? The guys who are in school already, the guys who are learning already, how do you ensure that they, you, know, uh, you, you, you boost their, the outcome for them? You ensure that the, uh, the learning outcome is, you know, is great. You create a good learning experience for them. For me, who is playing the space where you know I need to get you know kids you know to school. Uh, again, if you understand how you know um, in Africa, for instance, um, we're very pro prolific, right? So we give back uh, per second, you know, um, and you know, uh, and we, our, our media age is very minimal uh, at the moment, it's about eighteen, right? So math for education is on the increase. So how do you ensure that you're getting more and more kids out of the streets? Uh, from the streets into the schools, right? So if you're able to track that, then you're making some life, some some very huge uh, uh, lasting uh, uh, impact uh, in a, in the education space in a way, mostly in Africa. Uh, uh, what I'm going to you know to work on the challenges that I highlighted earlier on is very also uh, straightforward uh, for us, right? As as a company, we we also very mission driven. Uh, so we 
are very intentional about creating, you know, programs in addition to what we do as a business uh, to impact the ecosystem. And one of such that we have created is called uh, the Business of Education Summit. So it brings together uh, stakeholders in the education space uh, and that we discuss, you know, solutions to some of the biggest problems that we have in the ecosystem. Uh, we've done quite uh, a lot of, had a lot of additions uh, in the past where, you know, we just, Basically, come and you know discuss actionable solutions uh, to some of these problems, and we've seen like the impact that program you know uh, has you know had in the in, in the ecosystem, like changing the game, and of course ensuring that you know system wise people are beginning to you know understand how best to deliver on quality education as a school owner, and how parents can support you know the schools to ensure that the kids access quality education, and of course how governments can play their part to ensure that you know they're formulating the right policies. Uh, so that everybody at the end of the day will be able to uh, um, uh, meet, uh, you know, achieve their uh, achieve their, their 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 end game in terms of what they're looking for uh, in the education space. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, you mentioned policy, which is a huge thing. Um, and, you know, it's like how do we as like the are these our founders uh, get into that space of helping to influence policy because a lot of these issues that we're addressing are major. Um, and they're impacting so many children, so many um, of our stakeholders. And it's sort of like getting to that point of influencing policy, which is, I know, an entirely different discussion. Um, but I think I want to touch on that in a bit. But I'm I'm going to go back to one of the questions um, that we have uh, for the panel which is um, how do you think your organization has worked with important stakeholders like schools or teachers um, and parents to really achieve its mission? Yeah, for, for us, um, uh, as, as a staff, uh, what, one of the things that we've done is to ensure that every school that we have on our platform is verified and, you know, uh, vetted. So, um, at the moment in Nigeria, for instance, we've got over 80,000, you know, private schools. Uh, some of these schools are not you know, the kind of schools that a lot of parents will not will want to send their kids to. So how do we ensure that parents are able to make the right decision? How do you ensure that you provide, like, the right kind of information on some of the schools, the right data that can help this, you know, parent to make well-informed uh, school choices for their kids? And on the side of schools, how do we help them, you know, up their game so that they're able to meet certain requirements to list to get listed on our on our platform so that they can enroll students through that channel. So we're doing all of this to support to support them as a school. You know, if your school is not not yet on it, what are the things that you need to do? What are the you know what are certain you know um uh, uh, measures that you need to put uh, measures that you need to put in place so that like at, by the time you meet those requirements, we're able to get on board and parents are able to assess you and uh, that way we're supporting. And Makita, what about you? Um, how are you working with our uh, stakeholders yeah. to help you achieve your mission? So I think one thing you talked about scalability, one thing we do is train the trainer. I think that's very important where we go in and we actually provide curriculum for the teachers to use. Um, so it may not be your actual product, but it may just be our coding language. It's a pretty simplified ladder uh, logic language. Uh, Adreno, if anybody knows it, it's just a basic programming language to teach kids basic st skills. But we also go in and actually give these teachers a curriculum. One thing is we worked with Chicago schools for a while and actually now Chicago um, to graduate high school coding is a required course for high school graduation for kids now, which is a great, I think that's where we need to go. Just like you would teach Spanish, French, we need to start kind of thinking about, like you said, it's a conversation for another day, but we need to start thinking about kind of changing the curriculum in a way that makes sense for the future job opportunities and what's where we're heading um, and the world's heading and that's technology. So. It's huge to be integrated with those kind of schools and to be helping those kind of um, kids with their um, curriculum and that kind of work where it's actually helping them graduate and moving them further along in the process uh, when we integrate with those kind of schools. And what we've really done in Chicago is work with charter schools to help them meet that requirement. So that's also something that we've done as well. And then we are trying to actually do more of in-house informal learning and move into selling directly to consumers and kind of giving that availability to kids outside of the school system as well to meet the parent and children kind of stakeholders where they are at, instead of uh, always being within that classroom environment. But I think for us, really the train, train the trainers and then where there are those opportunities to really influence curriculum and get those kids to pass basic requirements 
for coding and other uh, STEM classes that we actually help those kids in either the actual classroom or in after school programs to kind of move them along that process and make sure they graduate. Yeah, I love how you, you're you providing these opportunities both in school and out of school. I think that's so very important. And at this point, you and Kareem brought up two really great points. And I just really want to pose this question, which is how do we get this world of education to catch up with technology? Um, you know, the classroom literally looks the same as it did uh, 50 years ago, where we have a teacher and we have students sitting in the desk and they're all learning like the same way but education it's it's different our kids are different the world is different and i find it interesting how you know the cell phone has changed the mm -hmm. automobile has changed the way we go grocery shopping has changed but in all actuality majority of our schools are staying the same so how do we get education to really catch up to these technology tools that we're creating and really technology itself because it is moving rapidly um we didn't have chat gpt when i started my company that was just a couple years ago now we have this tool that like literally it makes my life so much easier and things go a lot quicker so i want to pose this question uh to you kareem uh how how do we do that yeah margo i think uh the first thing though to highlight is sometimes things look like they're not changing and they're staying the same way. And in, in actuality, they are changing. Um, and then there are other things that are structurally that way. Like you could go back to the times like ancient Rome, right? And teaching was done in the same exact way with a teacher at the front of the room or uh, leading a circle and folks sitting at a desk. And so I think what has to evolve isn't the structure so much as it is uh, what we're teaching and why we're teaching. Uh, the purposes have changed. And I think one of the biggest like flaws in our education system today is that we don't teach folks how to apply their knowledge. Um, we assume that folks know what to do with the knowledge that they're given and there's no application after that. And so it could be the person who's the most consumed with all the information in the world. And if you do nothing with it, right, that whole knowledge is power slogan is being rewritten. Um, knowledge isn't power, right? It's what you do with that knowledge that gives you the power. And so I will say things are changing. I think, how do we get schools to adopt more technology? Um, COVID, as much as it sucked, was the best example of how you do that. You have to force it onto them, right? Uh, necessity is the mother of innovation. When we closed down schools, folks were forced to get on Zoom sessions, on Meet sessions, and that disruption is what created acceleration on the technology side. And so I just don't see, I don't want to say we need like a, God given like natural disaster, but I do think we need some more leadership that is willing to step out of the comfort zone and say, this is the way that it is now moving forward and you need to get with it or you're gonna get left behind. And until we can get to that level of push, um, we won't get there. And I don't think everything from COVID was great, but what we're seeing now is a, a balance, right? Teachers are integrating technology more as a result of COVID and what they've learned during that time. But if that didn't happen, that force wouldn't have been there and we wouldn't be where we are today. So I think we need more of that. I totally agree. Um, uh, Jenny, you came off mute. I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so uh, I agree with Karim with what you said about, you know, how people have become, so, uh, become very powerful, like in bridging assets, right? And of course, creating equitable access to quality education. And of course, just ensuring that, you know, our kids learn uh, quality, the kind of content that they consume. Uh, is able to prepare them for the future. But having said all of this, right, I would say that we need to have a balanced view of technology, right? Technology is not the solution. Technology is only an enabler, right? So it's like a conduit, you know, to, to the solution. The solution is still is is there. How do we, you know, help our teachers, uh, empower them to be able to deliver on quality education? What kind of training do they need to have? How do we even help our teachers to use technology to deliver quality education, right? How do we, you know, help schools? assist them to technology to be able to take as many students as possible, you know, into their school and, you know, um, prepare them for the future. All of these things are, are issues that we will need to address while we're building all of these technology and solutions. So that actually kind of, it, it brings me to a question that I have uh, for Kareem. And it's, I really want you to discuss the role that you think that tutoring and coaching and alternative education models, um, like how they contribute to expanding opportunities for our underrepresented students. 
I think COVID finally made what had existed for so many affluent children who received private tutoring or homeschooling accessible um, because government finally said, hey, we know this like ancient practice has been working for centuries to accelerate learning. Why aren't we giving this to the kids who have the least amount of resources and who need the most help and attention? And so it isn't something new. It's something that we've always known has worked. And I think it is really important. And when you're able to tutor, you're able to personalize education, right? We, if you have 30 kids in a classroom, you have 30 different ways of learning, 30 different speeds of learning. And tutoring allows you to find that speed for that scholar and make sure that they're able to get what they need. And then it also allows you to change what you're teaching and how you're teaching, right? Going back to that element of culturally responsive content. How do I figure out what Johnny or Jose or Jordan likes and how do I integrate that into what they're learning so they can relate to it and be more excited about the content that they're consuming? And so I think missing that is taking out a big part of someone's educational experience. Now, I don't think every single kid needs tutoring every single day, though if you could afford that, it's amazing. I think what we need to be better at is figuring out when someone is slipping or when someone needs support, right? When they take an exit ticket or they take a test and they score a 50, are we providing the intervention immediately to make sure that they can master that content and get to proficiency and then pull the tutoring away when they've now caught up and they figured out where the gaps were. So I think if we can be more intentional about those moments when someone needs support, then we'll be able to save a lot more resources. But I'm in the camp that if you can afford it, you can have it all the time, then great, right? Why not personalize more instruction for more kids and help them move faster? Yeah, um, I love that response. Uh, I think that personalization word is it's 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 obviously like a common theme, um, and so I want to kind of kick it over to uh, Miss Makita. Uh, so, how do you think alternative education approaches prioritize the development of social and emotional skills? Um, how might this emphasize or contribute to reducing disparities in educational outcomes? Absolutely. I love that question. Um, I think, first of all, one thing we need to look at is what, why there is a disparity in education. And it's easy to say, of course, that there are not the resources or they are not, teachers are not doing certain things or policies, but what is controllable is keeping these kids engaged, using the tools we have at our fingertips to make sure that we are doing the most possible, what we have to do to make sure we're maintaining retention. So I think part of it is actually looking within the system that we're at right now and saying, why are these kids dropping out or why are these kids not focused or why are these kids not doing well in certain subjects? And when you look at that and look and actually look at the pain points of these children, then you kind of get to see how much of it is based off of confidence, how much of it is based off a of support system. To Kareem's point, not having that actually encouragement, not having that personalization, not having engaged families. There's all these other factors that have nothing to do with intelligence and really nothing to even do with interests that will kind of delay children or take them completely out of certain tracks, um, which are very beneficial long run to long run in the long run because they lead to more job opportunities, they lead to more income, they lead to just a better overall quality of life. So for us, what we focus on is really confidence building and personalization that's very easy to do in an informal environment where you can kind of A, do little things like just make early easy wins for the kids, really tailor the curriculum to build their confidence up and start then start challenging them using peer-to-peer -peer networks as part of that informal education platform where you engage them with kids in other areas that are similar to them, but may not live around them so that they have that broader community and people who look like them that they can engage with. You can also start to do little things like just make it more, for me, I think the biggest thing for girls, especially is personalization. We really focus on products that girls want to use and that we make them codable. Shoelaces, bracelets, just little fashion items and actually applying that like uh, Kareem was talking about, actually taking that technology and actually using it to apply something and learn something instead of just you have a device. How do I actually do something with this device? And how do I personalize this device? Or how do I code this device to do something I would like it to do? So really bridging the gap in those kind of ways, I think is super important in it. I think informal education gives you the freedom to do that. I think the first step is really understanding the pain points though of why these kids are dropping out of these subjects beyond just you know the overall problem with education that is going to be a long, long road for any of us to solve in terms of policy, um, curriculum, and real and access and resources. How do we, within the systems that we are in right now, make sure that we're not losing kids? And then once we solve that and understand the pain points and actually teach to those pain points, then we have retention, which overall will lead to 
kind of these kids continuing on that journey and, and overall employment. And for us, our mission is we teach kids and we teach girls in STEM education today so that they can work in STEM careers tomorrow. Because we firmly believe that if we keep them in these fields, they will eventually, if that's what they want to do, they will now be able to pursue that and they will continue on that journey. Oh my gosh. Can we drop some fire in the chat for that response? Because that was like spot on. And I think when it comes to like this SEL, the social and emotional learning, um, and I'm not sure why it, why it is this way. A lot of our adults, we sort of underestimate why, how important this actually is in the growth and the development of students. Um, with my platform, like we solely focus on just self-esteem because we understand that if a child's self-esteem or if anyone's self-esteem is low, if that self-image is distorted, they are not accessing their full potential. And this plays a huge part in other educational outcomes. And we've been able to see that, hey, if we improve a kid's self-esteem, other areas will also improve. We're going to see a reduction in youth violence. We're going to see an increase in their academics. We're also going to see an improvement in their mental health, all because they love and value who they are as an individual. And this makes them productive in school and then in their communities and then in the cities. And then it's like, why are we not pressing more of these sort of non-academic based subjects with students in an effort to help propel the academics and propel the success um, of our youth? So I, I really want to address a question that we have in the chat. Um, I think it's Bernadise. Um, and sh she wants to know, she or he, I'm not sure. Um, so please forgive me. But how are how are you addressing the gap between education and employment, as well as preparing our target audience, primarily composed of youth, for the future of work? This is such a great question. Um, and I would love to shoot the question. Jade, you can uh, kick us off with your response. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to uh, future of work, right? So I think uh, Maketa will be in the best position to We'll talk about this because I mean, um, we need to empower our children uh, for the future. Uh, technology is playing such an important role, right? So, and there are quite a number of things that uh, at the moment that we need to teach them, right? Um, um, space technology, uh, STEM education, robotics, you know, coding, all of these are, are the languages of the future. So, how do we like, you know, just empower these kids? We do all of these, uh, you know, uh, skills so that they are future ready and they can, you know, uh, fit into the into the into the future work. Uh, but having said that, I think one of the ways that we can support as a platform is to just ensure that the schools that we have on our platform are also this kind of schools that can prepare, you know, these kids have all of these resources. You know, have teachers who can deliver on this resource on, on this on this um, uh, pedagogy right curriculum so that these kids are well equipped. But again, I think, like I said, I will leave that to Makeda. Uh, to talk to talk about. Thank you uh, for that response. I, I, I would say drop some fire in the chat for, for that as well. Um, and Kareem, what about you? Uh, how, how would you say that you're like addressing this gap? We have the, the luxury of being able to hire a lot of current college students and recent grads who are actively looking for work in the workforce, um, but are in the sort of like nick of things right now. And so I think the most powerful thing you could do for someone is give them a positive role model, someone that they aspire to want to be like, and you have those authentic and real conversations about what's happening today. So I think the, between using the AI and all of our workflows, equipping our education champions, with the tools on that side, and then being the positive role model for them, it's almost happening organically. Can I can I also jump on this? Um, so one of the yeah. things, um, yeah, one of the things that we also do, uh, at Edusco is we sometimes collaborate with, you know, uh, where many you know organizations are within and outside of, of Africa, you know, to to organize boot camps, tech, tech boot camps, and we have one of the biggest in Nigeria at the moment. It's called Bonvita Tech Boot Camp. Uh, it basically prepares uh, uh kids between the ages of. Uh, nine to sixteen, so the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution is a very big, uh, very big uh, book camp. Uh, this is one of our contributions to the ecosystem. In addition to just providing a platform, uh, we are supporting you know these kids uh, to learn you know desirable skills, skills that can help them, tech skills that can help them you know prepare uh, for the future. 
So thank you for that response. Um, I love, I just, I love this conversation. It's like giving me a uh, goosebumps. Um, there, there's another question in the chat that I would like to ask the group. Um, and it's how do you track and record your impact produced by your programs? Um, the question is asked by Aisha Hudson. Um, and I know for us over at Enrichly, we measure pre and post. Uh, so we use a Rosenberg uh, scale to measure the self-esteem. And it's something that the CDC uses. Um, we use that before and after and then sort of have a combined um, sort of outcome based on where they started and then where they ended after they were exposed to our programs. Um, and I know our stakeholders love to see like the data behind what it is that we're doing. So I love to know from Makita, I'll let you kick it off. Like, how do you track your impact? Um, and are you going to, do you think you need to make any changes um, in the future? Yeah, I love that question. I think one thing we focused on were the three core kind of um, things that we thought that were kind of the pain points for girls in STEM. One was confidence, one was engagement, and then the other was competency. And those are very easy to track um, for us because we do work with an online platform. So girls can go in and answer questions at the end before and after the quiz is built in. So the competency part is very easy for us to figure out if they're learning and how quickly they're learning and applying um, what we're teaching them in the curriculum. Confidence and engagement really is just, engagement is also easy. We do track how long they use our products, how long they want to stay using it. When they have an option to use this in after school, how many of them pick it back up and log in and actually do this over another task or another um, learning tool that they could possibly use. And then uh, confidence is something that we kind of look at as we're answering the questions and how willing they are to get a wrong answer than when they first started. So just, just how much more confident they are with the material. And then we also have some quizzes and questions that we ask them as well uh, year over year. What we want to do different in the future is we're actually far enough out where we can start to track actual outcomes in terms of retention and leading to those educational impacts. And so now that we're old enough, um, not as old as Kareem, but we're getting there in terms of the age of our company, now we can start to say, okay, great. I just went back to the school in Chicago and said, how many of these students can you give this survey? Because it's a charter school. So I have that information from elementary to when they graduate from high school. Now let's start tracking how many of them are interested in going on into college and pursuing these subjects and starting to see how many of them feel proficient in these subjects and how many of them are interested and what they and especially for us, it's really showing them the opportunities in STEM and starting to track that. Like, do you know you can be a graphic designer using coding? Do you know you can do UX design? Do you know you can kind of engage with fashion in different industries? How do you, you know, what opportunities are you seeing? So that's where I want to go next and really want to start focusing on is that long-term bridge um, between just engagement and competency and confidence and actually it equaling better employment, better opportunities for these kids. And that just takes time. There's no way to get there quicker. Yeah, McKay, I'm going to jump on the timepiece. And so the, the improvement area for us is just more longitudinal data. Like I, it's costly. I know that is something that is really important because in education, we have what's called the sleeper effect. Um, it's not super widely known, but it was the backbone behind all of the funding in early childhood and the lack thereof at first. So uh, this goes back to the 60s when uh, they started with the Perry preschool model. And someone had a hypothesis that if we started educating children earlier, that they would actually do better in school. And it, you know, sounds very straightforward and obvious, right? And so the idea of pre-K started that way. So pre-kindergarten with that notion. And then they gave kids who were starting kindergarten um, a pre-test and a post-test and compared them to their peers. And they saw that the kids who had done preschool did better than the kids who didn't have preschool in kindergarten. Uh, then there was no intervention until fifth grade. And then they retested the kids again in fifth grade. And this is where funding for early childhood sort of lapsed because they saw there was no difference between the kids who did early childhood programs and the kids who didn't. So they're like, why are we wasting these resources here on an early childhood intervention? Uh, luckily, the researchers followed the kids again until post high school graduation. Uh, no material differences between them, except uh, some of them had early childhood and some didn't. And that's where we saw the greatest outcomes. Kids who had done early childhood programs were less likely to have been incarcerated, more likely to have been employed, higher income, less likely to have been pregnant as a teenager. And so then everyone said, oh, this is like, obviously early childhood learning makes a big difference and now we can see it. And so in education, when we're talking about measuring impact, sometimes we're just focused on the pre and the post or the short-term impact when really what we're talking about is changing someone's life, changing their perspective, um, and that's going to take 
time, right? That transformation. Like when you talk about an enriching summer program or being able to invest in someone going abroad and experiencing a new culture, there's no immediate impact. That impact comes later. So for us, we look at four critical data points, um, attendance, we look at math proficiency, reading proficiency, and graduation rates. And so depending on the school we're programming, uh, partnering with, or the programs that we're running, uh, we'll tie all of our indicators of success back to one of those. And we design all of our programs in collaboration with the schools to move the needle in those four areas, recognizing that it may not be a direct link immediately, but this is what we're working towards in concert with our partners. And we're looking at their state exam scores after they come out and we're doing pre and post tests as well, depending on the program throughout as we're running. So um, I think to everyone's point, measurement is expensive and it is tricky, but um, the most important thing we can do is find research-based practices and go implement those with fidelity. And I think that's where we sometimes struggle. It's the fidelity with the implementation, not so much the actual program. Thank you for that response. Um, you're giving me a lot to think about. You know, I mean, we definitely want to measure self-esteem development amongst other areas of outcome. And right now we're just tra tracking like youth behavior, um, like educational achievement. Uh, so what are their grades looking like in school? But like both you and Mikita said, it takes time. Um, you know, if we want to track these children from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade and you know like in college how do these tools impact them as they're growing and as they're going into the world you know being productive humans um so jude i'll let you answer the last piece which is how are you uh tracking your impact uh, with your tools yeah so what the way we track um impact is very simple uh so uh the, the we, we track how many enrollments that we uh, that we uh, that we provide in for schools. How many parents are able to leverage our solution to get into get their kids into the schools, right? Uh, over the last um, three years or so, we've been able to you know place over twenty five thousand kids uh, in different schools across Nigeria and in Ghana, right? So how do we even double on that uh, uh, and just you know get more people into good schools? Um, but the next level for us. Uh, is to uh so at the moment my myself and my we're building a kind of algorithm that can basically just you know match kids uh, based on certain parameters like you know this kid said that they have uh their their traits and just match them with the kind of education that would nurture them up until they finish you know college and of course get a job and how do we track you know the progress that they make from that uh, early early stage up until they are able to you know achieve whatever they want to achieve in the future. So we're building an algorithm at the moment, and we hope that once that is ready, we would also be you know tracking learning outcomes, uh, you know, uh, for kids that are uh, able to use our platform, you know, to to access good schools. Oh wow, I love that. Um, and it's it's I love how we can all like track our impact, and we have the data to show, like, hey, what we're doing is actually having a lasting impact, um, with our students. So, um, Makita, I want to I want to let you in end us with uh, this answer to this question, which is how has your fellowship helped shape your journey as the leader of your education enterprise? Oh, wow. Um, first of all, I, I, I think we're all very busy. So the fact that we're all here as alums um, just shows the value of global good uh, fund. Um, and I feel like I'm a lifelong learner myself. And the reason why I got into this is because I, I just am intellectually curious and I love to learn. And I learn so much every time I engage with people in this fellowship. Outside of just the journey um, from that time that I was a fellow, as I engage with you guys, and even in this panel, I have learned so much from my fellow panelists that I will apply and that I can continue to make my product and, and my company better. Um, so I just think the continual uh, network and the continual engagement with Global Good Fund has set my journey aside in terms of where I am now. If I had not been a fellow, I don't think it's comparable. I think the other thing is just the, the same things that we think about with children, we as adults need support, self-esteem issues, confidence, um, someone who understands us, someone who looks like us, someone who is interested in the same things we're interested in. So I think all the things that we are trying to give to our students are things that we also make need to make sure that we're giving to ourselves. And I Global Good Fund for me is just that support system and that network and my tribe. And sometimes you just need to go find your tribe. So I think beyond just the 
the mentorship they've given me, the coaching they've given me, and the continual learning environment and the continual gems and just wisdom on how to just be a better businesswoman and how to just improve my product and then also just how to make changes that are actual in the education space. It's just honestly the people in the community that is just the most invaluable to me. Um, and so I always give as much as I can to you guys um, because you always, you've given me a lot. So not to plug the global guy, I don't want to go too far in it, but I really, I really think this is one of the best uh, organizations I've ever participated in. And it's really one of the few that I stay in touch with and try to really continually engage in because I get so much out of all of our interactions. Look, I am here for all of that, all of those uh, responses, because I feel the exact same way. Um, so I know we're at the top of the hour. So Sandra, you can take it away. First off, that was the best. Honestly, such an enriching conversation. And I feel so privileged to know all of you and just kind of be a part of this. So I want to say thank you so much, Margot, Kareem, Maketa, Jide. This was just Oh, exactly what we needed. And I feel like now we need another one on edu tech space so we can discuss later what this is going to be like because that was enriching. And I feel like there were so many questions left over. Um, I did everyone a favor and I plugged the LinkedIn for all of our amazing panelists here. I am uh, So feel free to either reach out to the Global Good Fund or, or them. Um, and at the same time, I want to say thank you to our audience. You guys were fantastic. And yeah, I'm gonna close us out. That that was it. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.